Hey everybody, welcome to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And in today's episode, we are talking with Fiona Tuck, who is a forensic nutritional expert with over 25 years experience in nutrition, nutritional medicine, skin care. And she's also a yoga teacher and an accredited member of the Australian Traditional Medicine Society. We are going to be talking about health. We're going to talk about nutrition. We're going to talk about gut health and all the most important things that you need to be doing in order to increase your probability of a long, healthy life filled with loads of energy. So for those of you who'd like to learn how to become more healthy, and get more energy, listen up. We're about to get tight real fast. Forensic nutritionist. Now, that's got to be a superhuman quality in itself. Like, Because uh, I'm going to assume this is like CSI for your dinner plate. Pretty much. So yeah, right. I really passionately believe that the majority of people aren't eating enough fruit and vegetables and enough nutrients. We're becoming nutritionally deficient. So what I'm all about is really becoming a detective with the dinner plate and looking at maybe what we could possibly be eating too much of, but also what we may not be eating enough of. So how to recognise suboptimal nutrition, how to recognise early health warning signs, and really to tune in and listen to what our bodies are telling us. Because I believe that the body never lies, the face never lies. We can see a lot by looking at people to tell us what they may or may not be getting enough of in their diet. You know, it's kind of funny because I literally just thought most people's dinner plate is a crime scene, but it's premeditated in most cases by 20 to 30 years. Because when you have the same dinner, you know, every night for 20 to 30 years, you end up with this condition and some conditions in some cases or diseases in some cases that can kill you. So it kind of is a bit of a CSI for your dinner plate. Totally. And what a lot of people don't realise, it's what we do every day repetitively repetitively that really affects us later on in life and even what we eat now can affect future generations to come so eating the same food every day isn't going to give us that variety of nutrients and that diversity of our gut flora which we're hearing so much more about and the importance for health and well-being we need really need to mix it up and get a variety of different nutrients on our plate so is that the difference between a nutritionist and a forensic nutritionist is nutritionist is more at the macro level and a forensic nutritionist is really looking at the 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 micro level and the the minerals and 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 the nutrients and well forensic the forensic nutritionist is the name of my book so that that really seemed to be the most appropriate name because it's about an investigative approach into health and well-being so really looking at what may be going on internally at a biochemical level because most people don't look at food as nourishment every single thing that we eat has a biochemical reaction within the body so what we put on our fork and what we put into our mouth has the ability to harm or heal. Mm. Most people look at food as something... Entertainment. Entertainment, exactly. Something that is going to keep us occupied, prevent boredom, or a lot of people look at food as either fuel or something that's going to make them fat or thin. They Mm. don't look at it as nourishment. So I'm really about trying to educate people about the nourishing value of food. So people call you the myth... The myth... uh, The myth... (laughs) The myth. (laughs) I uh, have trouble uh, saying that too. (laughs) The myth butter. of uh, the nutritional space. So what are the, what what big myths have you busted in, in your career so far? Oh, there's so many. You just have to hop online, look on Instagram, look on various different nutrition websites or bloggers' websites, and there's so much misinformation out there. And a lot of what is available online is really to sell a product, to create a cult tribe, and to get people to subscribe and to follow. And it isn't always about the health and well-being of that particular person. So I'm really about giving a very balanced approach to health and well-being, looking at the pros and the cons and looking at everybody as an individual because there is no one-size-fits-all approach. So the ketogenic diet may be right for some people, but it's not right for everybody. Mm. So it's really looking at what works, what doesn't work, what you need to know, because most people will put information out there in a very biased manner. And there's always two sides to the story. For instance, one minute coffee is good, one minute it's bad. Some people think it's the devil. Some people think it's actually a bit of an angel. So it depends what studies you're actually looking at Mm. as to whether you think it's bad or good. So I'll give you both sides and then I'll give you my summary and my opinion. And I think 
that's the challenge because you can really these days find a study to support almost any perspective. Pretty much, absolutely. Uh, which in science is almost ironic when you consider the, the goal of science is to find the ultimate truth and the ultimate facts, but oftentimes the facts are very conflicting and oftentimes the facts in some cases are manufactured to support bigger you know, bigger goals or, 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 or corporate missions in some exactly. cases. Exactly. And, um, you know, even when we look at the government's perspective on health, you know, because I, I, I even said this to people and this actually came up as a conversation over um, – it's fun, it's just something as small as micro, micro, uh, Facebook doing sampling with your microphone and listening to certain parts of conversations, and people saying, "Oh, it's not true." You know, here's a whole bunch of published research articles saying that the, you know that this is a myth. And I was like, "Well, you know, for about sixty years, they published a lot of factual articles that tobacco doesn't cause cancer, and the user experience was very different." And I think that's the challenge: is there is so much misinformation out that we don't know who to trust. So, who do we trust? Do we trust you? Well, this is the thing. This is why I always try and keep it real. I'm all about balance and the longer that I practice nutrition it all comes back to balance a little bit of everything and not too much of any one thing you know some people will tell you, you must only eat organic if you don't eat organic it could be carcinogenic for you I know plenty of people that have eaten a purist diet eaten all organic food and have still ended up getting sick and dying of cancer which mm. is awful so you know, there's nothing studied to show that if we don't eat organic food, we're going to get sick. Mm. It's about choosing the best quality produce we can. If you can afford to eat organic, then certainly go for the less processed and less chemically treated produce. But it doesn't mean to say that non-organic is going to kill you. Yeah. We, we need to keep it all in balance and in moderation. You know, it's so funny she's that because I, I do organic as much as I possibly can. Uh, but last night I, I kind of freaked out a little bit because I had to go to the supermarket across the road to grab my um, uh, my punnet of salad um, and it wasn't organic. And last night I, I made my salad, I made my chicken and then I ate it and then after it was like, fuck, I forgot to wash it. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I was literally like, and, I, and my brain, I'm highly analytical. I started thinking, oh fuck, what does that mean? What if you actually did that? Like what if you, because I eat two giant punnets of salad every day and I wondered if I did that every day for 30 years without washing the salad you know without using organics what the actual consequences of that might be well the thing is you've got to look at what else you're is going into your diet mm. so if you were a party animal, you're taking drugs, you're smoking and drinking or having certain medications that can have knock-on effects and nutritional deficiencies and side effects, then that's all going to build up as toxins within the body. But if you've got a really clean lifestyle, if you're not eating organic or if you eat organic now and again, it's really not going to have any long-term effect on your health. You've got to really look at what you do every day mm. that's going to have that long-term effect and how much of it that you're actually having as well. Right. So let's look at a baseline because I think for some people, they don't even know what healthy feels like. So how, do, how would you define health in a way that everyone could kind of relate to? I think health really means feeling the best that you can be, feeling vibrant, feeling energised, feeling happy, feeling positive and waking up in the morning with the spring in your step, ready to face the day, ready to go out there and, you know, face whatever may come your way. But a lot of people have to drag themselves out of bed. They weight themselves up with caffeine. They literally can't get out of bed without the caffeine. And they start with sugar for breakfast, basically carbohydrates, no protein. And they get onto that roller coaster of blood sugar swings. They're not feeding their body with nourishment and nutrients and they're feeling tired and depleted. And then they get into this vicious cycle of craving the sugary foods, craving the junk foods, maybe coming home and drinking half a bottle of wine because that's their only way of coping mm. to help them feel relaxed and to help them feel better about themselves. So it's really coming back to starting at looking at the diet. Okay, so let's let's talk about coffee for a second because a lot of people say to me, dude, you must drink a lot of coffee. I don't fucking touch coffee. Although I did start drinking three weeks ago, half shot almond lattes on a Saturday morning to keep up with Woo. my I know, right? <laughs> fucking party animal. Uh, but I, I literally started doing that because I was like, well, you know, I, I haven't had coffee really properly for probably as a, a coffee drinker for I think it's probably, f I used to say eight years, but I said eight years oh. for like seven years. Uh, so I think it's been like 14, 15 years. But one of the things I find really interesting is, you know, I do get a nice little uplift for a moment, but it's not long thereafter. I come crashing down to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm trying to keep up with my son, so I have a little bit of coffee. But then afterwards, like, oh God, I feel like shit. But what I found really interesting was 
next Saturday, I felt like doing it again. Mm. And it's like, again, it's that, that addictive quality of caffeine. Totally. But what I'm curious to know is are there, because I'm going to assume a lot of people listening to this are coffee drinkers. You know, it's one of the most uh, widely accepted drugs uh, that we peddle, addictive drugs, highly addictive drugs that we peddle on a regular basis uh, commercially with a, a, a total level of acceptance. Is coffee something that can be used, you know, in a way that can actually support health, or is it literally just this demon that we've wrapped up in in, in toilet paper to, you know, be able to wipe up the shit of the stuff that we don't want to deal with? That's right. Good question. I think again, it all comes back to balanced moderation. Mm. There are recent studies that show that there are antioxidant protective health benefits from drinking coffee because the actual coffee bean is rich in the polyphenols and antioxidants. So there is some cell protective benefit there because of the caffeine like um, reaction in the the brain coffee can therefore be a stimulant a mental stimulant so for people that aren't very mentally focused it can help people give them focus and give them that mental alertness so if you need that if you're trying to concentrate or study then in that respect coffee could be beneficial where coffee falls down is that a lot of people rely on it as their stimulant to get Mm. them through the day because they don't have their natural energy and they're not feeling full of vitality they're relying on that coffee i say one to two cups of coffee a day good quality coffee is absolutely fine but if you're relying on it for longer than that and you're having it throughout the day, then you're looking at that as a stimulant and as a crutch. And we need to look at why you need to be relying on that coffee to get you through. And then that could be related to a stressful lifestyle. It could be related to nutritional deficiencies as well. And let's not forget, some people will react far more adversely to coffee than Mm. others. Some people are very, very sensitive to caffeine, just one or two mouthfuls, and they're a a jittery mess and because what happens with caffeine it will have a stimulating effect on the nervous system and it acts in a very similar manner to adrenaline so if you are always on the go if your adrenal glands are always being stimulated and you're further stimulating them with caffeine that can be too much for many people and also you know people with heart problems high blood pressure that's when caffeine isn't advisable so Really one good coffee a day, if you're constantly relying on it, then that's when it really is an addiction. Or if you literally can't go a day without it, that's when it becomes Mm. an addiction. So I am curious to know, I've never thought about this question, but it's a great question because one of the things I've discovered with, I'm ADHD and I've known a lot of ADHD people, uh, and ADHD is also a predisposition in some cases for addiction, especially for stimulants because, you know, I remember the first time I took a stimulant and for the first time in my life I remember thinking, oh my God, for the first time in my life I feel normal. Um, And what I've find interesting is that you know Ritalin is now used and prescribed uh, you know which is an amphetamine it's mm. a stimulant on a regular mm. basis uh, and I would say and again this is just not my opinion this is also the opinions of many experts that I've spoken to they would say like 99% of people who are prescribed Ritalin shouldn't be prescribed Ritalin there's like this 1 to 3% I, I agree with you but what I'm curious to know is is something like caffeine can that be supportive as a, as a form of stimulant that might support someone who maybe has ADHD In my opinion, in my experience, I haven't really seen it be that effective because, as you say, they can have addictive personalities Mm. and so then it can actually become an addiction. What I see more beneficial is to look more at the brain on a biochemical level. And quite often people with ADHD can be deficient in certain nutrients. There can be genetic glitches where um, they're not producing enough neurotransmitters and certain nutrients can actually benefit them. There are, there's new research now with NAD, which is a vitamin B3 niacin derivative, and you can actually have NAD therapy, IV infusions, which bec- which is becoming very, very um, beneficial for people with addictions. Yeah, right. They can actually have this infusion every day for a period of time. Sometimes it's 10 days. What's that called? It's called NAD therapy. There's a clinic in Bondi that I know is the only one in Sydney at the moment that's yeah, doing right. it. It was used... So it's a vitamin B3 intravenous injection? D- derivative, derivative, yeah. So it's actually called NAD. Right. Um, so it's a derivative of vitamin B3. Now, what vitamin B3 does, it will affect the neurotransmitters of the brain. It helps to calm you down, so it will help to keep you focused. What it can also do, it's being used in the anti-aging realm because what it will help to do is repair the enzymes that 
repair DNA. So it's it's helping protect the telomeres. It's helping with longevity as well. So very beneficial for addictive behaviours, ADHD type behaviours, and um, sort of drug, alcohol, that type of thing as well. It's so nice to hear people using you know this kind of thing because obviously oftentimes in recovery and because I'm an I'm an addict and it's oftentimes very concerning that nutrition is is a huge component you know by, huge. that is left out yeah. of the treatment process. Cleansing yeah. is a huge process that is left out of the treatment process uh, when in fact it can be in, in, incredibly potent. So let's let's maybe loop back for a moment to the importance of good quality foods and getting the right produce. You know, there's a lot of information out there that's now saying you know. A tomato today is not the tomato that was like 30, 40 years ago. You know, it doesn't have the same micronutrients, doesn't have the same mineral content, doesn't have the same nutritional content because, you know, with the amount of fertilizers and the amount of uh, propagation that we do, you know, we've literally got in some cases food that looks alive, but it's mostly dead, if not just full of fiber. Well, what's your take on that right now? I do believe that some of the food that is available to us isn't as nutritious as it could be. And that's because of the density of the soil and the nutrition in the soil isn't as um, good as it could be. So we're not getting as much magnesium, for instance, because there's not such a a high quality of magnesium in in the soil. So we're not getting that enough fruit and vegetables. We are getting some, but not enough. Well, I've read a lot of research lately saying that most people are chronically magnesium deficient. Yes, I would agree with that. And signs of magnesium deficiency can be fatigue, tiredness, chronic fatigue type syndromes, in, uh, symptoms, inability to cope with stress. And then, of course, we can get the sugar and the coffee cravings and chocolate cravings, yeah. which is a classic sign of a magnesium deficiency. So most people need more magnesium because we use it up every day. We need magnesium for energy. And the more carbohydrates, the more sugar we eat, the more magnesium we, we utilise as well. Right. So I'm also curious to know now when we not just look at the produce, we also look at things like, you know, where our meat comes from, where our fish comes from. Um, you know, there's a lot of really scary stuff out there right now. When we talk about fish because I, you know, I like meat, but I'm, I'm, I, I typically try and reduce mm-hmm. my meat consumption like maybe once a week, twice a week. Uh, but fish, I love it. I uh, love salmon, love tuna. But I, I've kind of had the shit scared out of me when it comes to eating even just, you know, great sashimi and great salmon sashimi because of the heavy metal contents and even the, the, the BPA and the plastic content that has been, you know, fed through the ecosystem. Like, what's your take on that? It is pretty scary. I mean, salmon naturally will contain selenium and selenium is a mineral that will help to bind heavy metals. So it doesn't tend to be such an issue in salmon, but it is more of an issue in tuna fish. But what is frightening is a lot of us are eating these oily fish, trying to get our omega-3s, our Mm -hmm. essential fatty acid content up. And if you're eating farm salmon, you're not getting that amount of omega-3 that we need purely because of the diet that the fish are fed as well. So that's when it gets really scary. We think we're doing the right Mm. thing, but we still might not be getting enough nutrients. And that's why I say to clients when they come and see me, they may say, I'm taking a zinc supplement, I'm having oily fish, I'm doing all the right things, but they can still be nutritionally deficient because they may not be getting enough of it. Right. So uh, it's kind of got to the point where I'm, I'm legitimately thinking about this. Like, do I just eat organic chicken? like free range organic chicken, like what is the best protein source when you're wanting to eat clean and you're, you're, you're conscious of heavy metals, you're conscious of you know, trying to get the right um, you know, nutrients and micronutrients from your diet. What's the best form of protein on the market in your opinion that's going to keep you healthy long term? Well, if you can get wild caught salmon, that right. can be good for us. Saying that, that's actually very hard to get hold of. Yeah. It's not that easy to get hold of. And it's interesting because I spend, my, my ex-wife is in Canada, it was from Canada, we go to Canada a couple of times a year. And it's interesting when you look at wild caught salmon and then you look at the farm mm. salmon, you're like, holy shit, these are like two different breeds of fish mm. almost. You know, we've got these heavy fat lines that, you know, are strewn through the uh, the farm salmon and the, the wild caught is actually quite a lean fish. It's, an, it's more oil in the meat than it is fat between the meat. Mm, I can imagine. I've never seen the two side by side, but um, it is pretty scary out there. When it comes to meat, I would suggest always trying to go for the grass-fed meat. And that's because with the grain-fed, there's higher amounts of the omega-6, which is a pro-inflammatory essential fatty acid. So when we're going for the grass-fed meat, it's going to lower that inflammatory response within the body. And with chicken, look, there's no growth hormones or things like that that are pumped into chicken. That's a bit of a a myth that's out there. That's actually illegal here in Australia. However, 
going for the organic chicken is something that I choose to do because I feel hopefully <laughs> that it's making a difference and it's free range as well. The the battery chickens, for instance, I, I wouldn't touch. Yeah, right. So is there is there an, um, a health – because, again, you did say at the beginning moderation is really important. And when it comes to things like salmon, when it comes to things like tuna, because I love my sashimi, uh, but I have become a lot more conscious of how much I consume. Should we be looking at consuming like uh, these fishes, like salmon, you know, you said is a, is a much better option, but things like tuna, for example, which, you know, is incredibly it's, – it's almost like gold mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to the fish markets. Should we be moderating our consumption of certain fishes? I would say mix it up yep. so that you're not eating the same food all the time. So have salmon, have tuna, but but have a variety. So it's not always the salmon, it's not always the tuna yep. because it's the variety that gives us the different nutrients. And when we're eating the same food every day, you can overdose on nutrients as well. And most foods or a lot of natural foods also contain heavy metals. People don't realise, you know, you can have arsenic in rice, for instance. Mm. Um, even natural sea salt contains traces of heavy metals. So we can always find the negative in any healthy food as well. It's about not overcomplicating it overthinking it, yeah. having a variety of different foods rather than go, okay, I've heard that kale is good for me, so I'm going to have it every day in my smoothie. That's when it becomes unhealthy. Yeah, right. Okay, that's a really good point. And I also want to look at the the, the, the medicinal benefits of food. Um, you know, I think oftentimes our, you know, we live, and I use this almost in every interview, the microwave mindset mentality, you know, the Insta mindset where we're, you know, we're looking for something really simple. We're looking for something really easy. Most people don't want to heal themselves or relieve their symptoms over the next 30 days days or, or three years, they, they want to do it in the next three hours if they can. And so it's, we've become very much trained to go to the doctor and get a pill uh, and relieve the symptoms. But again, you know, we're very much looking at, we're treating symptoms, but in many cases, we're not treating root causes or, or the problems themselves. Is, from your experience, food something that can be used in some cases as a form of medication for certain conditions that are very common and in some cases chronic that we experience today? Yes and no. So what I mean by that is Food works far better as a preventative medicine rather than a cure medicine. So it depends on the state of the disease and how advanced it is. If somebody, for instance, has got very advanced cancer, no amount of food is going to fix that on its own. They would have to have medical intervention. It's gone too far by that point. But eating as healthy as we can will actually help to protect ourselves, will protect our body from a lot of food-related diseases. You know, if we have a diet high in carbohydrate, high in sugar, then we are setting ourselves up for obesity, certain cancers, cardiovascular disease, um, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, even things like Alzheimer's and dementia can all be affected by our diet. So definitely looking at food as a preventative is first and foremost the most important way to go. But looking at food, for instance, when we maybe have got a cold or a flu and choosing things such as bone broth to help to strengthen the immune system, looking at a turmeric, anti-inflammatory, looking at garlic and onions, that can be very, very beneficial. Looking at our antioxidant intakes and our vitamin C can actually really help with that. So there is definitely a place to use food as medicine and in the Asian countries it's used all the time Mm. as medicine and Mm. that's really how I got into nutrition. I used to go to Asia a lot for work and I would train people over there in skin health and at the end of the day the locals would take me out for dinner and they would tell me what to eat depending on what they thought my chi or my energy was like and they'd say you need this red food and that you need this and not have that and you must have this today and I had never looked at food as medicine in that way before and that really led me to become more fascinated with traditional Chinese medicine Mm. which I haven't studied by any means it's like a seven-year full-time huge in-depth course but so it takes longer to study Chinese medicine than it does to become a GP in yeah this yeah pretty much it's yeah. it's very in-depth and I would love to study it one day but I've got a fascination and have done a lot mm. of self-study in that regard and asked a lot of questions and then I went to study nutritional medicine because that was what led me to that curiosity and looking at the root cause and the 
the reason why we would need certain foods for for different reactions within the body. Because again, I, I, I've there are a lot of places that are popping up now that are you know that are saying that they can treat all sorts of illnesses just through the use of food. But something that seems to be becoming very popular now, um, which I've been doing for almost 20 years, which is fasting. Now, I originally started fasting in the traditional sense of, you know, seven to 10 day water fast, the use of colonics. Wow, hardcore fasting. Yeah, like full contact fasting, basically. You know, I'd have my psyllium and my bentonite clay four times a day. I'd have the herbs that would loosen up, you know, all the stuff that had, you know, compacted and, and, and got stuck in there over time. And I was actually really quite amazed at some of the things that were coming out of my body and some of the some of the experiences that I was actually having that in some cases science say no that's impossible mm. that can't happen that's that is impossible um, but what was interesting is I used fasting almost like a um, like a uh, like a microwave mindset I'd do it twice a year you know every six months I'd go and heal myself and then I'd spend another six months then fucking punishing myself yep. you know and my weight weight would fluctuate up and down and then I discovered intermittent fasting about two years ago and that has been completely completely transformational for me. So before we talk about, um, you know, whether we should be doing water fast or whether we should be looking at the intermittent fasting schedule or, you know, whether or not that's for everyone. The first thing I want to ask is fasting as a concept, is, have you got any experience in this area from, from a, a research perspective or even just personal experience? Well, it's very interesting and it's a very debatable, controversial mm. topic because if you speak to anyone in the medical profession, they will tell you that you don't need to go on a detox because you're you have a very efficient <laughs> liver, yep. um, kidneys, skin, lungs. There are organs of detoxification, kidneys, and so if they're working effectively, then we shouldn't need to go on a detox. So in that regard, I support that and I agree with that. However. Most people don't have a clean lifestyle. Mm. Very few people do actually. Even the people that say they have a clean lifestyle, I've known healthy people that are very into fitness go on benders at the weekend and take cocaine and go crazy. And that's a toxin. It's highly toxic and highly dangerous and it's one of the most easily overdosed drugs. I'm I'm really (laughs) anti-drugs. But people do it and it's a very uh, normal culture here in Sydney in particular, which is quite frightening. And I find that these detoxes attract a lot of people that have a toxic lifestyle, Mm. half healthy and then half toxic. And then they think going on this cleanse will actually help them. I believe that if you have a lot of junk food, if you do have toxins in your system, then going on a cleanse, my personal belief is that it's going to lighten the load on the system and it is going to actually let the liver and all the organs of detoxification do their job a lot easier. Now, what a lot of people don't realise with the liver, for instance, you've got phase one, phase two and liver clearance. Our bodies, it comes back to nutrients again, needs nutrients to even help the process of detoxification. So in theory, yes, we do have organs of detoxification that should clear the body of toxins. But if you're already deficient in certain nutrients, then the organs can't do their job as effectively. Mm. So going on a cleanse can actually help to lighten the load. But at the same time, we still need to make sure that we're getting those nutrients in the body for the body to be able to detoxify. So if, in my opinion, if say a water cleanse and a clay cleanse, that would lighten the load on the body and clear the body from toxins to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the nutrients, if you don't have the vitamin Bs, the zinc, the antioxidants and protein, which you need for phase two liver detoxification to clear that out the body, it's not going to be a thoroughly effective cleanse. So I do think you need some nutrients during that fast or cleanse, if Mm -hmm. you like, and you do need a little bit of protein too for the maximum detoxification to occur. It kind of then provokes an interesting question around the overconsumption of food because we do need you know certain minerals um, and nutrients in order to ha- cleanse effectively. But I also think that food has been sold to us in a very commercial way. Totally. Whereby we are told that we need breakfast, lunch and dinner. Uh, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Um, but what we're also now discovering through science is that if you know the, the intestines have the largest blood supply of any organ in the body and if we're constantly putting matter 
pasta in there, if we're constantly putting food in there, of even of any quality of food, there's going to be a lot of energy that's used by the body in order to digest through the digestive process. And what you know, I've discovered through my own research, but most notably through my own experience, not just my experience, but hundreds of clients that I've, because I don't just do business. Mm. Like I, I'm very health orientated. Mm. And one of the things I understand, if you don't have good health, you don't have good energy. If you don't no. have good energy, you know, you're not going to be the best version of yourself totally. you can be, whether you're in a relationship or in business. And if you want to succeed at business at the highest level, you need more fucking energy than anybody. Absolutely. And so health is a pinnacle there. I'm hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Um, Amen. But, but what I found really interesting is when you start removing the amount of consumption that most people have from their diet still give them the same nutritional content still give them the same caloric intake but instead of having it over three meals in some cases having it over one or two meals yep. that are closely put together you know we're actually giving the body the ability to divert energy and resources that in most cases is on full-time work 24 7 shift work that is used to digest food all of a sudden that energy is now then diverted to things like the cleansing of the liver to right. the cleansing of the kidneys to the cleansing of the lungs so what's your take on the overconsumption and the fact that perhaps, you know, fasting as a, you know, full contact fasting, that may not be for everyone, although it's been proven to be very effective mm. for most people, but intermittent fasting where people look at a schedule. And again, I want to make this clear for people who are listening. Intermittent fasting is about looking at a schedule, whether it be a five and two on a daily schedule or, you know, in some cases it's an, a schedule where it's a 10, uh, a 10 and 14 in terms of hours per the day or the eight and – what's the fuck? My math is terrible. My math is terrible. Eight and – Eight and anyone? Eight what's eight from twenty four? Fuck this is embarrassing. Sixteen. Uh, and then you've got the you know the the four and twenty. Um, but what's interesting is based on the science that's coming out now, they're actually noting that the greatest biochemical responses is happening after 18 hours of fasting per day where the body literally just work shifts into this overdrive of not just cleansing. And it's not just about the cleansing but also mm. the ability to rebuild itself mm. uh, even at a level of DNA that in some cases scientists are going, we don't understand how this is happening. It makes total sense to me because it will also lower your IGF-1, it yep. will lower your insulin yep. and it will – allow ourselves to become more sensitive to insulin so it's it's helping to regulate blood sugar so it will help with um, weight as well I think naturally as humans we are designed to fast I think naturally mm, so if we said. tune into our bodies and really listen to it if you have dinner at six o'clock and then you get up uh, th- then sorry you have dinner at six o'clock for instance and then ideally in an ideal world have dinner then then we don't eat anything we go to bed and then you have breakfast in the morning let's say you have breakfast at 7 a.m even if it was 6 a.m that's still a 12 hour fast and that's why it's called break fast because mm-hmm. we are meant to have that fast in the evening whenever it is really but we're meant to have that period of time without food for exactly the reasons that you've just mentioned So I think naturally as humans, we're meant to do that. But what has happened is we get home late from work, we have a big dinner, then maybe we're stressed, we have more snack foods and we drink more. This is what a normal person will do. And then, as you've said, that digestive system is constantly overloaded. It doesn't get a rest. It doesn't get a break. And this is why we're having all these problems with obesity and blood sugar fluctuations and all sorts of health conditions. So I think If we naturally listen to our body, that would be something that we do. A lot of people wake up at six in the morning and they don't feel like breakfast. I know I certainly don't. And what I say to people is don't force yourself to have breakfast if you don't need it. If you are somebody that naturally has blood sugar fluctuations and low blood sugar and you go very lightheaded or faint or you've got a job where you need that mental focus, then you may need to have something to eat first thing in the morning. But for a lot of people, if they say to me, I really can't face the thought of breakfast, that's fine. Have it a little bit later on. Have it at 10 or 11 o'clock. No problem. And then you're actually going to get an even longer fast in. And in my mindset, that's actually a good thing. That can be really, really beneficial. So I'm with you on that intermittent intermittent fasting. I also think if you have too much food one day, naturally, if we listen to our body, we won't want to eat as much the next day and I know that if I've had a really sort of uh, indulgent weekend of having too much food quite often the next day I don't eat I might have something light at night time but I can go the whole day without eating quite easily and I think your body will naturally reset Mm. but when we get into that habit of 
breakfast, lunch and dinner and what I think is worse is having the snacks in between or having small regular meals, which I don't personally agree with, that's when the system never gets a rest. And I think we do need to give the system a rest, just like you've said. And I think it's also important that we look at where we're getting our energy from. Uh, and, you know, you've, you've hit this a couple of times with, um, you know, carbohydrates and sugar. And I'm not, I'm not anti-carbs. I love fucking carbohydrates. My body doesn't. My body's not as much of a fan as what my brain is. But what I find really interesting... You would if you're ADHD. <laughs> you, would want, you would want the carbohydrates. Oh, That's another story, but yeah. yeah. Okay, well, this will be... Well, maybe we'll go there. But um, what I am curious to know is um, you know, this concept of fat adaption and I'm not necessarily talking about the ketogenic diet keto, the keto diet seems to be something that's very popular right now but fat adaption is something that goes hand in hand with understanding the intermittent schedule and, and the science behind intermittent fasting which is whereby one of the biggest challenges most people have is they're, they're sugar adapted and their body is they craves a constant source of whether it be simple carbohydrates in the form of, of sugars it is like instant release energy which creates those highs and those lows and those crashes or in some cases certain carbohydrates you know especially if they've been processed carbohydrates that can create almost like a, a simulated sugar response. Totally, yeah. Um, but again, it creates that up and down, that crash perspective. And one of the things that I found incredibly enlightening um, when I became fat adapted, and fat adapted, becoming fat adapted was a challenge. Like I'm pretty sure it took me four weeks before I you know, stopped having those ups and downs. And by fat adapted, and for the people who are listening, uh, I basically got to the point where I was fasting for 18 hours every single day. My body was still used to using carbohydrates. So I was having the, the blood, what I would characterize as what felt like the blood sugar lows, you know, the stressful events and experiencing the, the desire and the craving to eat something simple, to eat something rich, to eat something fast. You would have been horrible to be around. Oh, dude, I'm horribly <laughs> around most days. But, um, but, uh, but after three weeks, all of a sudden there was this, it was almost like something clicked. And then I went from, you know, waking up and then by getting to 9 a.m., 10 a.m. going, oh, I really need to eat. I know I didn't need to eat. But then I can get to like, now I can get to like two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And then I go, okay, now I need to eat. But what's interesting is my energy is through the effing roof uh, and my ability to sustain energy is through the roof as well. But I've also dropped almost uh, 16 kilos now in the last two years wow. without any dieting. It's just pure lifestyle. And of those 16, of those of the last two years, I can say hand on heart, I didn't train for 18 months of those. That was just pure diet, just purely just, you know, conditioning myself to only eat between a certain time. And in most cases, still eating just as much food and not depriving myself. I have donuts on the weekend. You know, I have my ice cream on the weekend and my cake on the weekend. Sometimes I have donuts a couple times a week. But what I found really interesting is when I became fat adapted, I almost looked at myself and went, okay, I had this big belly and they said fat is energy. And I'm like, well, then if that's the case, I'm a fucking nuclear power plant <laughs> just waiting to ignite. But then over time, that energy started to get utilized during the day without the requirement for carbohydrates, without the requirement for caffeine. So when we look at, you know, people who go, well, I can't do something like intermittent fasting because I get low blood sugar. Is there certain conditions that characterize, okay, you should be eating more than other people? And are there certain situations where it's like, well, no, that's just your addictive habit. That's just your habit of consumption of food and the types of foods that you're consuming. If you stick at it, you too can become fat adapted and literally burn fat you know, as an energy source and actually have consistent levels of energy, high levels of energy, high levels of clarity, um, you know, versus what most people have to do. That's a really good question. I'm a big believer in there is no one size fits all approach and you've got to listen to your body. And if somebody really feels awful cutting completely back on the carbs and they get shaky and they get lightheaded. I mean, it, it can be dangerous, particularly if somebody is, I don't know, a long distance truck driver or a pilot or something like that. You don't want to be putting them yeah. in that situation. Cool. Cool. Um, so, you know, you've got to really work with that person and find out what's right for them. It's not going to be right for everybody. You know, I've worked with a variety of different people and the low carb diet works for a lot of people. And when I say low carb diet, I'm all about low carb diets. I actually promote that. So I don't promote a highly refined carbohydrate diet. I don't think that's beneficial for everyone. So I think everyone can come off the refined carbohydrates and reduce the amount of bread, pasta, wheat, um, cakes, cookies, donuts. Eating that type of thing isn't going to be good for the blood sugar. But having moderate amount of carbohydrates, having the, the grains and having, you know, whole grain bread and brown rice and quinoa 
in a proper portion controlled amount can be beneficial. But where I think we fall down is most of us don't know how much to eat anymore. Mm. And what is a portion? We eat probably three times the amount. So for instance, a controlled portion amount of potato would be half a medium sized medium to large potato it's not very much at all and most of us will have three four five potatoes <laughs> yeah, six a day i see them on your desk <laughs> you know so we're actually eating too much of it it's not always about the actual food being demonized mm. it's about how much of it we're eating and this is why in a way the intermittent fasting has become so huge is if we really listen to our bodies i think we would naturally be doing it Anyway, but mm. because of diet and lifestyle and the food that's accessible to us, we're eating too much of it and too often. And this is where we go, okay, well, let's all do intermittent fasting. So I am a promoter of it. It does work. It is good for our health, but it's not always the right thing for everyone. You know, I've, I've been – because I've had a conversation with a couple of people about this and I've always just sat back and gone, okay, maybe it isn't. But I, I want to push back for a second mm. respectfully mm. – and the thing that I love about intermittent fasting is because there are so many schedules. It's not just well, this is one it. Yes, yeah, I agree all. with you in that regard. And I think if you find the right schedule for you, I don't know any human being on the planet yes, that wouldn't I agree benefit with you. Sci- even yeah. based on the science from yeah. f- from fasting as a part of their diet. Yes, if you put it that way, and kind of what I was sort of leaning towards earlier is if you could even do a, a form of intermittent fasting by eating really earlier on, having a mm. dinner really earlier on, and not having a breakfast, or you, you know, having a brunch, and yeah, if you want to call that intermittent fasting, which in a way it is, then it would be beneficial well, to really everyone. It's just really hitting that that, yeah. that time frame by yeah. which the body starts to kick into that the biochemical Absolutely. processes where yeah. you know IGF one is lowered, BDNF is increased, and we have this ability to divert energy to other sources <clears throat> for other reasons. But I also want to touch on a point that um, I find very interesting, and I wish I'd touched on this with other experts that we've interviewed. Is what I refer to as healing reactions um, or healing symptoms. You know, because I've taken people on when I used to do my Fast. I'd take people on the, the long-term fast. I'd put people on the intermittent fasting schedule and I've had all sorts of people go to me, oh, I'll, I'll start with the long-term fast, so the, the seven to 10 day water fast, because that's the full context yep. stuff. Now, normally by day two, I've had people go to me, oh, Kerwin, this is not good for me. I've got these fucking wicked headaches. Yep. This is this is not good. This is bad. I need to start eating food. And, and my response has always been, no, that's your body getting its shit together. Okay, that's your body getting rid of stuff. Just push through it and you will get to the other side. And I've literally had people argue with me and, and look, maybe this isn't the best medical advice yeah okay because i'm not taking anyone over there that's you know necessarily has had uh, chronic disease or shouldn't be doing yep. a fasting under medical supervision i'm talking about people who just have bad lifestyles who may be a little bit overweight in some cases quite fit but they're like oh you do this fasting thing you know i see you come back well let me try it i take them over there you know they they feel nauseous they feel tired they feel fatigued and then i say just push through just push through just push through and then sure enough you know day two day three day four and all of a sudden, day five, they start feeling electric. They start feeling trans- transcendent. They start experiencing this high level of energy and this high level of mental clarity that they've never experienced before. And so I think one of the things I'm curious for is when people try different schedules and they try different things, is understanding the difference between what does your body actually need versus what is just a symptom of your body healing. What's your take? Good question. I think when you go on any fast, you're going to feel pretty lousy for a while and there Mm. will be headaches, there will be detoxification, withdrawal symptoms. But again, you still need to look at the organs of detoxification and if they have the right nutrients Mm. to support them. Because what can happen is, let's say you're not getting enough protein to support phase two liver detoxification. And so your body starts to detoxify. It's and depending if you've got chemicals and more things to detoxify, those potent toxins are then turned into more potent toxins, which we not, we then need phase two to sort of clear them and break them down. If phase two isn't working effectively because we're not getting enough of the amino acids to do that, those toxins can recirculate in the system and you can feel even worse and even more lousy. So... It can in, in be that a, instance, it can the can, body start consuming itself to get the protein requirements for stage two detoxification? Well, normally what will happen is you'll just have really quite adverse side effects from the detoxification because what's happening is you've got these toxins circulating mm-hmm. in the system. And is this what we call autotoxification, where the body just automatically starts retoxificating itself? Yes. Right. And then what will actually happen is we're getting higher exposure to free radical damage and stress within the body. And that's when we have to be careful. So just by 
having some very gentle liver support. That's why, for instance, if you were doing a fast, I would say have bone broth during mm. the fast to just help to support that. Just something light. It doesn't. I'm not talking about having steaks and things during the the fast because that you know you've got the red meat and that's not really going to be great for the colon. And having something light to support that can be really really beneficial, and that can actually help to minimise the side effects of that. But generally, going out without food for long periods of time, you are going to get headaches, you are going to feel lightheaded and that's because of the low blood sugar and your body having to adapt for mm. that. Because it's interesting, you know, because I've even used the metaphor before, someone said, oh, this is not good for me. I said, oh, that's like a crack addict who goes into, you know, goes into, yes. goes clean, goes into detox and yeah. all of a sudden going, oh, shit, hang on, I feel terrible. Not having crack is, is bad for me. It's like, yeah. no, no, that's just your body sorting itself out. So let's talk food and mood for a second, you know, because, um, again, we, li- we are living in an over over prescribed uh, society, yes. culture. Yes. Again, microwave mindset, I don't feel good. Okay, I'm going to go to the doctor and get a pill, get an antidepressant. Um, is there correlations that you've seen as in your forensic work to be able to identify that there are certain foods that will support uplift in mood and a general feeling of well-being and there are certain foods that when you consume them will actually you know increase the probability of you feeling stress, of you feeling depressed, of you feeling you know, mm, lower level absolutely. of emotions. Absolutely. So the more processed food we eat, the more sugar, um, that's definitely going to lower the mood because those foods tend to be lower in nutrients so we're not getting that nutritional support that we need. When we're eating a lot of sugar and refined foods and processed foods, we're not getting the B vitamins that we need to support our mood. We're not getting um, the antioxidants and it leads to a little bit of a vicious circle. You eat the bad food, you eat the donuts, you eat the pizza, you eat the, the processed meat and the Coca-Colas and the alcohol, you feel bad, that lowers self-esteem and then you eat more because your self-esteem is low and it can get into and like then a, you get fat and you look in the mirror and go, exactly. I look like shit, I might as well and it's more. like exactly. And yeah. that's really what happens to an awful lot of people. Now the food that we eat plays a huge, huge role on our mood. And quite often when I see somebody that's really flat and really depressed, the first thing I'll look at is the diet and always test them via pathology work in particular for iron levels, vitamin B12 levels, folate and a really important one that a lot of people get deficient in is vitamin D. Mm. And when we're low in vitamin D, our mood becomes very flat. We have that sense of we have nothing to look forward to, nothing excites us. We just can't find our mojo, you know, nothing's really going to sort of get us excited. And we can be quite emotional about things as well, a little bit more sensitive than normal. And that's a classic sign of low vitamin D. Which is a bit of a challenge in our society because we're told never go outside unless you've got a hat on, unless you've got full long sleeve clothes. And if you do, you take your clothes off. You know, you slather yourself in chemicals to ensure mm. that none of this, you know, none of the vitamin D from the sun gets through. So is it fair to say that we are actually living in a chronically, in a vitamin yes. D chronically deprived yep. environment because of this? And I'm not saying don't be sun smart, but I, I agree. think there's also sun yeah. stupid. Exactly. Which is like we're wrapping ourselves exactly. up. Exactly. I mean, I see some mothers that are lathering sunscreen on young children, you know, thick layers of chemical sunscreens. And in my mind, that's doing even more, you know, Mm. what is that doing? Because those sunscreens get processed through the liver. It can't be good for us. Um, You're better to cover up via clothing and have at least 20 minutes of sun exposure a day on the skin, not in direct sunlight, you know, at midday, but Mm -hmm. have some sunlight exposure every day to get that vitamin D up. Now, the darker your skin, the more prone you you are to vitamin D deficiency. If you wear sunscreen and if you keep covered up and you don't even go out in the sun, then of course you're going to be prone to vitamin D deficiency. And we are seeing chronic um, vitamin D deficiencies and the majority of the people I see do have low vitamin D. And they don't have a tan. And they don't have a tan. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, look, we could talk about um, suns because I know you've got a, you know, I know you, you built the Skin Institute, um, which you, you sold last year, which is, would say, indicate to me, you know a lot about skin and you know a lot about the treatment of skin and skin cancer. But I'm, I'm just going to, maybe actually I will go there just really quickly mm. because obviously, in, especially in our country and other countries people listen to, they've, they've probably got sunshine, but they're probably also being, you know, fed with the propaganda that sun is bad and there's no, any sun is bad sun. If you are going to use a sunscreen, because look, some people, they do go out in the sun 
Okay. Some people go, well, you know, if I can't use a chemical, because most sunscreens, I'm sure you would agree, are laden with chemicals yes, I that in some cases have been proven by certain yes. research to say yeah. they are cancer causing. And again, it depends what studies you, you look, look at. at. My yep. personal view is that they are quite toxic yep. and where possible go for the more natural based sunscreens. I mean there are some chemical sunscreens like the the Ava Benzone. It's got a it's got a different name here in Australia that is quite quite toxic. Um, I know when I was with Skinstitute, we were one of the only companies to use a sunscreen ingredient that was one of the safest ones available. And the reason sunscreens can be so toxic because they've got the, the chemical ingredients in there, but they also break down on exposure to UV and then create their own free radicals, which creates more damage to the skin, which is why when you're using a sunscreen, you always need to use a topical antioxidant with it um, because that will help to further protect the skin as well. And then getting the antioxidants through our diet, particularly the vitamin A and niacin, vitamin B, they're really important internal nutrients to actually support skin health and skin immune health as well. Okay. The one last subject that I want to talk about is inflammation. Again, yes. we're talking a lot of, we use, I've dropped the word chronic a few times now. Um, but again, I, I think it's, it's probably fair to talk that, you know, we do live in a society where we do experience high levels of stress, high levels of free radicals, not just what we put into our body, but we're also being bombarded from the outside mm. as well. Uh, and a lot of our lifestyles, whether it be from a psychological perspective, but then you combine that with a nutritional perspective and you combine that with a work life balance, we, we do have incredibly high levels of stress put on the body, which creates inflammation. And I'm curious to know your take on inflammation and the role that it's playing in, in some cases, a lot of the chronic illnesses that even going back 40, 50 years ago, we weren't seeing at the levels that we're seeing now. Well, most disease, the majority of disease, if we really look at it, is affected by inflammation within the body. So inflammation is a normal healthy process of the body to protect us from Mm. um, damage or injury and that's to help to enhance the healing process of the body. But that's healthy. But where it becomes unhealthy is when we're exposed to chronic long-term inflammation within the body and that usually comes from free radical damage which occurs from not having enough nutrients in the body to fight that free radical damage off and the free radical damage does come from stress it can come from just general living and breathing and the general metabolic processes so we need the nutrients to counteract that sugar alcohol all of these things will actually further aggravate inflammation and i also think as well that eating a lot of plant-based oils will actually further cause the inflammatory response within the body. So most processed food has got some form of canola or plant-based oil in it. Now these oils are very sensitive to light and to heat and they become rancid, they become oxidized, which when we ingest them are going to further promote inflammation in the body because we're eating oxidized rancid oil. But also these oils are very high in the inflammatory omega-6 and the omega-6 becomes inflammatory when we're not having enough omega-3. And cutting back the processed food therefore can make a huge difference in reducing chronic inflammation within the body and cutting back on all the the cooking oils the plant oils extra virgin olive oil is probably the healthiest oil we can cook with but you know forgetting about the the canola oils and the sunflower oils and we're just already getting too much of those so use the olive oil that's a very extra virgin olive oil because of its anti-inflammatory compounds and its antioxidants and then really upping the omega-3 content from your oily fish and possibly taking actually a omega-3 supplement to actually counter back counteract that inflammation is really important. I'm also starting to see now turmeric is becoming like this incredibly popular nutritional supplement Um, and also turmeric with black pepper because a a lot of people don't realize the importance of the bioavailability of certain supplements are enhanced when you when you mix it with certain uh, with with other ingredients. So turmeric and black if you're going to be taking turmeric I'm sure you'd agree black you need need a good supplement that it contains. Yeah or you can add black pepper look (laughs) even then it can be a little bit misleading because it's it's the Kirk come in inside the turmeric that's got those potent anti-inflammatory beneficial properties. Turmeric, when we have it with black pepper, the 
what the black pepper does, it's sought to excite the cell membrane to enhance the bioavailability of the turmeric and the absorption. So black pepper derivatives are actually commonly used in pharmaceutical drugs. Um, there's a it's an ingredient called piperine that helps to, and in skincare as well, to mm. absorb, uh, to help the absorption. But you also need the presence of fat as well. So you need some form of fat with your turmeric, so fat and black pepper to aid the absorption. It's one of the most hardest ingredients to actually absorb. Is that right? Yeah. I didn't know the fat one. I, yeah. Actually, that's incredible. Yeah. So I'm surprised someone hasn't come out with a, a supplement that is combining like omegas, uh, omegas, black pepper and curcumin. Like that's... Like yeah. This is there you go. We're on to something. Hello. <laughs> Joint venture. Okay. That's awesome. Um, I want to finish this up by really looking at the importance of, because, you know, I think a lot of people when they when they approach health, they look at it based on, again, the microwave mindset or the event-based or the diet-based approach. Um, and, you know, I learned this in my own life, not just with my health, but also in business, also in relationships. You know, when we treat the problems that we have as symptoms that we can perhaps extinguish very quickly with, you know, um, Band-Aid. A Band-Aid. Yep. We often don't really get down to the root cause. And I, I've found, you know, whether I, if I'm working with a business owner, the first thing I need to get them to do is understand that, you know, growing your business is not something that you do one or two days a month. It's mm. a mindset. It's a psychology. Mm. You know, performance. If you want to be an elite professional athlete, you don't just train really hard once or twice a week. your life. It is your life. You wake up thinking about it. You go to sleep thinking about it. You dream about it. Uh, and, again, I think a lot of people approach their diet in, or their health in, a very same, in very much the same way. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll do my cleanse every Christmas. How do we how do we incorporate what we've talked about here in a practical way so that people can make that significant shift to be able to go, okay, I'm going to actually approach this not as a something I do now and then. I want to make this a way of life. Where do I start? The main areas I would say to start in is to really up – the vegetable intake and when I say fruit, you know, a couple pieces of fruit a day is a really healthy way to go. So we're really looking at between seven to ten pieces of well, of vegetables and a couple of pieces of fruit. So look at eight eight serves of veggies a day and a couple of pieces of fruit. That sounds a lot and it is a lot. Most of us aren't getting anywhere near that amount. So you need to be having vegetables breakfast, lunch and dinner. If you're having two meals a day, then you've got to get it all in. Otherwise, we're not having enough nutrients in our diet and mix it up. So have different foods every day. We become creatures of habit and we'll have the same lunch mm. every day or the same dinner I'm or for instance if you have an omelette you always have it with spinach and mushrooms you know why don't you mix it up one day have it with goat's cheese and tomatoes you know you've got to get creative and show that you can expose the body to a variety of different nutrients because that's going to be so important to get that different variety that we actually need for internal health and well-being. And also we know now that our gut flora needs diversity as well. So that comes from eating different foods, but we need the prebiotics which come from the vegetables. The prebiotics provide the food for the probiotic. And we hear so much about the probiotic, the good gut bacteria mm. but those gut bacteria cannot survive unless they've got the food to munch off which is the prebiotic and the best source of fiber is vegetables actually and that's where i was going to go to because the prebiotic actually uh, generate and multiply as a result of the fiber yes so is it the vegetables themselves or is it the fi the uh, insoluble fibrous nature of vegetables that yes, provide that? that's right so it's more the the fiber um, from the vegetables. Yeah. So, you know, that's my next business venture is the internal supplements or the whole food nice. powders for this very reason. For people that maybe don't know where to start, they can add whole food powders, which are basically uh, vegetables and fruit with the prebiotic, the Jerusalem artichoke, which provides the fibre for the prebiotic that they can add to smoothies, make it really easy for them. And they know that they're going to be getting mm. their serve of fruit and vegetables Is every Cillium day. Is psyllium husk a good, um, good fibre for prebiotic production? Um, psyllium will a certain degree sort of, the inulin from Jerusalem artichoke is very good. Things like sweet potato as well. Look, I say any vegetable yeah. you're going to get um, benefit from and eating the variety as well. Psyllium 
is really good source of fibre and it's good for internal cleansing and, and bowels as well. But psyllium is quite harsh on the gut. So some people that have got things like IBS type symptoms find that psyllium when they first start having it, unless they've already done work with the gut to sort of soothe the inflammation and mm. to start the healing process, for some people they don't tolerate psyllium that well. Okay. I don't have an issue with it. I love psyllium, but just again, there is no one size fits all of approach. Course. For some people, slippery elm would be a better option for right. them. Right. Okay. Good to know. Um, and again, when we look at lifestyle, again, it's all about moderation, obviously, which means that there's got to be a balance. Uh, and I think one of the challenges that a lot of people have when it comes to you know living a healthy life, they go, well, I don't want to deprive myself of the things that I love. Mm. And I'm not sure what your take on, on this is, but I am curious on your perspective. Like, Do we need to completely remove the diet, the donuts and the pizza from our diet? Or is it something that we can entertain you know, once, maybe twice a week and still actually have a healthy and balanced lifestyle? I thought you could say once, twice a year then. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, want those donuts and that pizza. I do. <laughs> Look, I used to be quite strict about it and, you know, I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, McDonald's is evil. But actually now I have a very different approach after working longer in the nutrition field. It is all about balance and moderation. And I actually say to people now, if you want McDonald's, have it. If you want to have pizza, have it. I wouldn't go that it. far. I'm going to um, say McDonald's. I said pizza. <laughs> well, no, but really yeah. you've got to live. And I actually believe that if you have – once a week would be your – tops yeah. right once a week would be tops maybe once a month but once a week if you want it and you've got a really clean healthy diet for the rest of the week then have it because not only is it showing diversity i think it actually is good for your immune system mm. as well because when we eat the same foods every day it does start to set up an autoimmune response within the body as well so i think having those different foods keeps everything new, if you like. Um, and it does actually, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, I think it actually is a beneficial thing. Oh, did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? You just got the you just got the hall pass. Fantastic. Look, I have absolutely – I don't think there's anywhere that I wanted to go that I haven't actually gone. Fiona, this has been a really awesome conversation. We're going to have to get you back in for another chat. I'd love to come back. Now, I know you're not just an incredible forensic uh, nutritionist. You also know an incredible amount. You're, you're also an entrepreneur. Like you've, you've built in a very successful business. You've sold yeah. a very successful business, which I'd like to perhaps get you back to talk about as well. Um, but if people want to find out more about you, have you got a book? Have you got a website? I know you've just sold – I've got both. You've got both. Um, so I've got a book. Out, which is available online from Booktopia and leading bookstores and also on my website as well. So the book is called The Forensic Nutritionist nice. and that's a great book because it looks into food cravings, what they mean, what you could be deficient in. It looks at looking at signs of nutritional deficiencies and what your body, you know, it's an individualised approach, what your body might be really, really needing. And so it's a, in a way a self-diagnostic support guide to help you know what the right thing for you to eat really is. And there's some recipes in there as well. That's available also, as I said, on my website. You like the Louise Hay of nutrition. That's right. I love oh, Louise Hay. With She's that, fantastic. Her book, um, Heal Your Life, yeah. changed my life. Mm, it's changed a lot of people's lives. I even have the app on my phone. That changed my yeah. life, that book. And I've lived by everything in that book. And miracles do happen, can mm. I say. And my website is fionatup.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming down. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say and your reviews. Make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media at Kerwin Ray.